فعاش القلب وإخلاصا وصرت تحومك الطير تحلق في ثقافات وتنهل من روبا الخير السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم in the name of Allah سبحانه وتعالى most gracious most merciful الحمد لله رب العالمين all praises due to Allah سبحانه وتعالى Lord of the worlds والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين blessings and salutations upon the one who was sent as a mercy to all the worlds وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين we ask Allah سبحانه وتعالى to send blessings and salutations upon his entire household and all his companions May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless every single one of us. Ameen. My beloved brothers and sisters, we seem so serious in this hall, mashallah. <laughs> so maybe I can lighten it by something that perhaps would make us laugh a little bit. When I came into Malaysia, and mashallah, I've been here quite a few times. I commented, you know, subhanallah, to one of my friends, telling them, Welcome. So I'm welcoming myself, you know, because now I'm half Malaysian, mashallah. <laughs> so I said, welcome to the land of milk and honey, mashallah. You know, the land of milk and honey means a place that you have everything, mashallah. So I recall that back where I come from, we went through a very big crisis at one stage where we had uh, no milk and no honey, in the sense that really we, we, we had to queue for bread and for milk and so on. Alhamdulillah, now the situation's eased a little bit, but this lasted a long time. So across the border, meaning as people cross into the country, there was a huge sign, welcome to Zimbabwe, the land of milk and honey. And some, some few meters later, someone put up a makeshift sign saying, we hope you have brought your own cows and your own bees, mashallah. Which means the milk must come from you and the honey must come from you. So the brother says, as soon as I said, welcome to Malaysia, the land of milk and honey. He says, hey, that's a big mistake. This is a land of roti chanai and tetari. Mashallah. <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. We would like to achieve Jannah by the will of Allah. We want to achieve paradise. We all want to go there. I want to be there and so do you. In order to get to a place, we all know that the shortest distance between two places is a straight line. We all know that. You know, back at home, there is a beautiful place called Victoria Falls. It's a beautiful place in Zimbabwe. One of the wonders of the world, the natural wonders of the world. And to get there, there is no straight line. You have to travel, although the straight line would be only perhaps three to four hundred kilometers, you have to travel about a thousand kilometers because it goes all the way to the south and comes back up to the north. That's the road that is there. So it discourages people sometimes. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an understanding. The reason I mention this, and I will also mention one more example. We all use the GPS today, don't we? We use it so often that one wonders how it was 10 years ago when we didn't use that, I, I've forgotten how it feels to remember turn left, turn right, go straight, do this, you'll see the building, you'll do this. It be, it's difficult actually. We have a GPS. That GPS sometimes will tell you the distance when you form a straight line that it's actually 5 kilometers away. And when you press start navigation, it tells you it's 10 kilometers away because it gives you a road that's winding and going to the side and coming this way and that way. We are taught, and this is the point I'm raising, that if we would like to get to Jannah, do not let the distractions distract you. Use the straightest path, the best and the quickest way of earning paradise. And that would be to be upon a path that was taught to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has created us. He's our maker. He made us. In fact, whoever made us, we call him Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we worship him. And we know that he would have sent messages to us through messengers in order to teach us what he wants from us. He wants us to adopt his commands. He wants us to earn paradise. He has actually created a paradise for us. And he has created this earth in order to test us. And this is why from the very beginning of life, right to the end, everything is a test. Everything is a test. Allah blesses us and even in blessings, there are tests. And this is because it is part and parcel of the path to Jannah. Part of the straight path is to be tested. To know if you are worthy of walking on this beautiful path. 
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to walk on this beautiful path, the straight path. But what is it? What is the straight path? Let's go to the first surah of the Quran, Surah Al-Fatiha. The opening, the opening surah of the Quran, Al-Fatiha. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to us. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of Allah, most beneficent, most merciful. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. All praise is due to Allah, Lord of the worlds. The term Rabbun actually includes the creator, nourisher, cherisher, sustainer, provider, protector, curer, and the one who is in absolute control of every aspect of existence. Rabbun. So Allah says, praise be to the Rabb of the Alameen. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, most beneficent, most merciful. Maliki Yawmiddin, owner of the day of judgment, which means he has kept a day of judgment in order to judge us and between us. So if I've had a problem with you and we haven't resolved it here, there is a day in which the, the solution or the judgment will be passed completely but we are encouraged to sort our matters out in this world before we get to the next because on that day one wonders who would be wrong and who will be right and you might have to end up paying a payment that you did not expect so this is why it's good to make peace with one another before we actually get to the akhirah but the judging as to your deeds and as to what you've done is a judging between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need to improve our relation with fellow human beings and we need to improve our relation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our maker. And one of the ways of improving our relation with our maker is to be respectful to the rest of his creatures because he made them. Allah made me, he made you. If I respect you, I'm respecting and honoring Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because I'm acknowledging that you are a creature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I have rights placed on my shoulders that I need to fulfill regarding you. And the same applies to you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will judge us even when it comes to the deeds between us and him alone. The only difference is when it comes to the deeds between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, we will find that Allah is merciful. He calls himself Rahman, Rahim. He will forgive. What he requires from you and from me is to try, to try hard to achieve the mercy of Allah. Try, ask his forgiveness. He knows that we are human beings. He knows the nature of a human being. He knows that we would falter. And this is why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Kullu bani Adam khatta, wa khayru khatta'een at-tawwaboon. All the children of Adam are prone to error. They make mistakes constantly. They commit sin sometimes. The best of those who make mistakes are those who constantly repent. So turn to Allah. Ask Allah's forgiveness. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive me and may He forgive you all and may He grant us all Jannah. So my brothers and sisters, the relationship between us and Allah is a far more beautiful relationship because it's based on mercy. He is so merciful. No matter what you've done, turn to Allah. That's the straight path. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us by telling us what He wants from us. Subhanallah. So that is why when He says He's the owner of the Day of Judgment, guess what? This surah is repeated. This chapter of the Quran, it is repeated so many times in prayer, in salah. And the hadith Qudsi, hadith Qudsi meaning where the Prophet ﷺ is relating to us what Allah has said, tells us that when we say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Allah responds. And the response comes saying that my worshipper has praised me. You praise Allah. Hamidani Abdi, my worshipper has praised me. When we say, Ar Rahman Ar Rahim, Again, a response comes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, My worshipper has declared my greatness. Maliki yawmiddin, owner of the day of judgment. Allah responds when he hears us say this verse. He says, My worshipper has glorified me. Subhanallah. And then when we say, and this is something very, very beautiful. Three verses gone. Three responses gone. Then we say, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ You alone we worship and you alone we ask for help. Listen very carefully. What have you repeated more than 17 times a day in Salah? And that I'm counting the, the units that we read in Salah. What have you repeated? You've repeated a statement that Allah loves. 
Allah loves it so much that He's kept it the opening verses of a surah that is most powerful. We are saying, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ You alone we worship. Which means I will never render any act of worship to anyone or for anyone but you, O oh Allah. And I will, subhanallah, when I am in need, I will ask you. And I will know that whatever comes to me, comes to me through you. You know, even if I were, for example, and I've given this example quite a few times. If I were to be seated around the table to be eating, subhanallah, and I were to ask you to pass me some food which was closer to you than me, I'm asking you for help, right? There's nothing wrong because if I can physically see with my eyes and understand with my mind that Allah has given you the physical capacity to do something, there's nothing wrong in asking you. But I need to know it is only if Allah wills that that will come to me. Allah might have used you to give me something. Like for example, you catch a taxi coming to this venue. The taxi driver is not the one whom you worship. He's not the one whom you seek help from ultimately. But you need to know it's Allah in the equation. Allah is the one who brought him. Allah is the one who made you afford the fare. Allah is the one who made the journey so simple that there were no accidents. And, and there was a beautiful journey. You arrived on time, mashallah. And alhamdulillah, you know, the, the, the brothers and sisters, mashallah, the venue is so full. It's actually an act of worship to make space for people. So don't feel I'm all squashed up. No, mashallah. We have Allah's blessings upon us when we don't leave gaps for the devil and for shaitan. So it is Allah who ultimately assists. It is Allah who gives. So we ask Allah. We seek from Allah. If Allah wanted, he could have frozen someone's hand so they wouldn't pass you the food. He could have done that. If Allah wanted, He could have stopped it and blocked it. He allowed it. He let it happen. So thank Allah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. Once we've said, you alone we worship, you alone we ask for help, there is a, an answer from Allah. Guess what Allah says? You heard the answers for the first three verses. At, the, at that point, Allah says, this is between me and my worshiper, and now I'm going to give my worshiper whatever he wants. That's a response. My worship has praised me, my worship has declared my greatness, my worship has glorified me, and this is between me and my worship, this verse. And now I will give my worship whatever he asks. What do we ask? <laughs> we only ask for one thing. There is no other call or supplication in Surah Al Fatiha besides asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us to the straight path. That's it. It's the straight path I want to be on. It's the most important prayer that a believer can make. That's why it's in Surah Al Fatiha. Have you ever thought of it? You repeat it so many times because that is. Really the summit and the, the, the epic of your entire life is if you're guided on the right path. Wow, subhanallah. Nothing brings about comfort and contentment, happiness and beauty more than being guided on the straight path. So what is the straight path? Well, read the verse before that. We just said, That's the straight path. So we are asking Allah, keep us on it. Keep us on iyyaka na'budu wa iyyaka nasta'in. Keep us upon worshipping you alone and seeking your help alone. This would be the right path, the straight path, the path straight to you. We don't need to, for example, go through a stick and a stone or a grave in order to earn the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No, we worship Allah alone. That is the straight path. And I will give you examples from the Quran to prove this more than so many, more than a few places in the Quran. It's been made mention of. And this is why if someone says, what is the Sirat al-Mustaqim? What is the straight path? Allah explains it straight away. He says, Sirat al an'amta alayhim. It is the path of those whom we have favored. The path of those whom you, O oh Allah, have favored. So who has Allah favored? So if you want to know who Allah has favored, subhanAllah, you, you, you go back to the verses of the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says beautifully, وَمَن يُطِعِ اللَّهَ وَالرَّسُولِ Whoever follows Allah and follows His Messenger. فَأُولَٰئِكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ So they will be with the ones whom Allah has favored. On one hand in Surah Al-Fatiha, Allah is saying that guide us to the straight path, the path of those whom you have favored. Now naturally a question is, 
Who has Allah favored? I want to know. So go back into the Quran and you find Allah saying that if you follow Allah and His Messenger, you will be with those whom we have favored. And then He explains who they are. He says, Those who are the messengers, they are the chosen ones. They are the ones whom Allah has favored with prophethood. Those who are the truthful, they are the ones whom Allah has favored. And as siddiqeen is a name that is also used to refer to some of the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, those who have given their lives for the cause of Allah. Those who have dedicated and given their lives for the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those are the favored ones. And who? What is the last word? As-saliheen. Those who are pure, good enough. Those who are pious. So if I want to be with those who are messengers and those who are truthful and those who are pious and those who have given their lives for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all I need to do is to follow the path of the same, to follow the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He sent to us a Qur'an. He sent to us a Qur'an and in Surah Ibrahim, Allah says, Alif Lam Ra Kitabun anzalnahu ilayka litukhrija nasa min al-dhulumati ila nur A book that we have revealed to you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to remove mankind from the darkness to the light. And dhulumat is actually the plural because there are so many paths of darkness. And the light is just one solid, straight path. So Allah says, it is a book we have revealed to you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to remove the people from the darknesses and bring them to the light, upon the light. And then guess what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says? بِإِذْنِ رَبِّهِمْ This will only happen by the permission of Allah. If Allah wills, He guides you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. This is why it is so important to keep asking Allah for guidance. This is why in Surah Al-Fatiha we have guide us to the straight path. Guide us to the straight path. We repeat it every rak'ah and unit of our salah. Without it, that salah is not valid. So you have to say guide us to the straight path. Because that is the straight path. Allah says, it is, it is me who owns this path. And it is me who guides to this path. It's the path of Allah. So we ask Allah and continue asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah says, بِإِذْنِ رَبِّهِمْ Allah will guide them to what? إِلَىٰ صِرَاطِ الْعَزِيزِ الْحَمِيدِ To the path of the most powerful, the one full of praise, the owner of praise, the one who is owed and who owns praise. So you want this path. What is the path? It is the path that is dictated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is the path that is found in the Qur'an. That is the path. If you have not read the Qur'an yet, you do not know what is the straight path. Really. You might just have a scent of it. But if you want to know clearly for yourself what is the straight path, you have to read the Qur'an. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it clear that this straight path is enshrined in this beautiful revelation that we have sent to you. It's not just sent for no reason. Read the Qur'an. Make an effort to read it. And that is how you will succeed. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, it is the path of those whom, you, whom Allah has favored. غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا الضَّالِّينَ Ameen. Subhanallah. It is the path of those whom Allah has favored. Not the path of those who have earned your anger, nor the path of those who are astray. So who are they? You know, whenever there's a path, there are always people on the sides, sitting on the sides, lounging around. People give you wrong directions. In my country, and this is something I don't know if it's the same culture here, when you go into the rural areas and you ask people, uh, how far is this, uh, you know, this street, or how far is this area? They will have to tell you, and I'm going to say it in my own language, Paduzi. Paduzi means it's very near. And yet it is far away. So I always ask them, how come you're telling us it's just behind this mountain when you know that this mountain is not even just here? And they tell you that, you know, it's bad in our culture to make you feel uneasy and uncomfortable. We have to tell you it's near, no matter how far it is. So they say it's near, just around the corner. And we're driving for another three hours and it's still the corner hasn't come. Subhanallah.
So to be honest, there are always people on a path that will tell you things that perhaps may not be accurate. It's up to you to know that these guys, this is their way, this is their system. If you follow it, you will regret. Like sometimes there are certain people who will, who will never admit they don't know a certain place. So when you ask them, where is it? Even if it's in the right direction, they're going to show you behind them. Oh, it's the other way. And then you start going the other way. You need to know that if the culture is such and the people are such that they are embarrassed to admit that they don't know, they will be misguiding you. The same applies to the deen. There are people who are embarrassed to admit they don't know. Some of the adults don't want to admit that I don't know how to do wudu or ablution properly. So they'll never come to say, please teach me. Hey, I'm old. Why should I go to this guy and, and ask him, please teach me? That is the straight path. The path that has no embarrassment in it. Nothing. Never be embarrassed to admit, I don't know how to read salah. I cannot read Quran. But my sister, you're a born Muslim. Nobody's going to say that, inshallah. You're just going to admit. Guess what? I don't know how to read Quran. Four months later, I know how to read Quran. Mashallah. Because it was an effort of four months. That's the straight path. No embarrassment on this path. Do not be shy. So who are those who we need to watch out for? Those who have earned the anger of Allah. We need to watch out for them. Those who follow the path. When the Prophet ﷺ explains to us in a beautiful hadith. You know, he used to draw diagrams in order to explain to us. And mashallah, I think he's the one who started this. He used to draw a diagram to explain what he wants to say. So he drew this diagram. He drew a straight line. Beautiful straight line. And the Sahaba were watching. What's he doing? And then he drew little other lines, you know, offshooting from that line, many lines. And then he says, Subhanallah, this is the straight path, meaning the straight line, straight path. Like we said earlier, the straight path is the quickest way to Jannah. The quickest way. Like I told you, the shortest distance between two places is the straight line. Well, the minute it's jagged, it's no longer short. It's going to be a problem. So this is the straight path. So he says, this is the straight path. And at the same time, you know what he says? These little paths that are on the side, every single one of them has a shaitan on it, calling towards it. And they are the paths that lead astray. They, it's the wrong path. It's something that is far away from the straight path. Each one of them has a shaitan. And then he reads the verse, Surah Al-An'am, verse number 153. We heard the reciter reading it a little bit earlier. Subhanallah. He says, this is the straight path. وَأَنَّ هَذَا صِرَاطِي Allah is saying, and indeed, this is my path. It is straight. The path of Allah is straight. No jaggedness. Subhanallah. فَاتَّبِعُوهُ So follow it. Follow it. It will get you to your destination. Subhanallah. If you follow it, it will get you to your destination. And do not follow the paths on the side. Do not follow these little paths. You see the word sirat is used in the Arabic language, for a path that is straight, for a path that is clear, for a path that is easy to walk upon. It's not something difficult. It's easy to walk upon. For a path that gets you to a destination that you so desire. The word used is sirat, not tariq, and not sabil. Subul, as we hear, heard in the other part of the verse, is referring to those paths on the side. Subul. These are different paths. These are different ways. They are, it's not actually a path. It's the ways of the devil. And this is why in another hadith, which appears in Sunan al-Tirmidhi and Sunan al-Nasai, uh, a hadith narrated by An-Nawas ibn Sam'an radiallahu anhu, he says the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam explained to us what is the sirat. And he explained to us so beautifully. He says, Allah has given the example of the straight path. The example of a straight path. And he says, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us the straight path is such that it has two walls on either side. So it's clear, you are focused, you can see that these are walls on the side. I must be walking here. It's clear for everyone to know. We as Muslimin, don't you agree? We know what's right and wrong. A lot of us would know what's right and wrong. But to follow that path is something we need to be encouraged. And we need to learn more because sometimes there may be things that we are still not aware of. May Allah grant us beneficial knowledge. So the hadith says two walls on the side, right? And then 
On those walls, there are curtains. Did you hear that? Curtains. And behind the curtains are doors. Behind the curtains are doors. And this is still the straight path. This is the example given. And there is a caller on the straight path saying, enter this path and follow it, all of you. He's telling those who are walking to say, follow the straight path, all of you. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is the caller calling all of us, saying, follow the straight path, all of you. And at every door, there is a caller calling us to something bad, to divert us from the straight path. Your test is whether or not you're going to walk on that path or... What is the meaning of the curtain? Why are there curtains and why are there doors? I'll tell you why there are curtains. Curtains are there to disguise the fact that this is actually a bad path. So to be inquisitive, to lose focus. Have you ever seen the horses when they're racing? They have blinkers. What are the blinkers there for? They are there to say, don't look this way or that way. You're going to be distracted. You'll lose the race. That's what it is. So they are blinkers. They, they actually close their eyes. And what happens is the one on it, the horse rider, is the one who's... Steering this horse to where it's supposed to get to. Amazing. So if we look too much this way or that way, or we become distracted by the zina of the dunya and the beautification of it, to the degree that we lose focus on the path, this is what is meant by this hadith, to say these are curtains. Your inquisitiveness can actually suck you into this whirlpool. When you become inquisitive, you look at this curtain and you say, what's there? What's on this side? Let's see. Wow, look at this curtain. So the curtain, the, the word, for example, just an example, the word love is written on the curtain. So you're looking at this curtain. Oh, love. Wow. You know, and then you just look at the curtain. You open the curtain a little bit and the door sucks you in and it's called zina, adultery. So it started off okay. It looked fine. When you looked at it, it looked beautiful. It sucked you into something. For example, I'll give you another example. The, 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 the curtain might say, for example, wealth, money. Oh wow, we all need money, don't we? And as you open it, you're sucked into interest and all haram dealings and so on. That's what it is. Why? You're so inquisitive. And once you're sucked into a whirlpool, you need to be a professional swimmer to come out of that. Really, you need to know how to get out of a whirlpool. Because it sucks you deeper and deeper in. This is why follow the path and watch out. As soon as you see this curtain, if your human weakness has made you become a little bit inquisitive, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, come back to the path, go and learn, get into good company, I tell you. When you are moving with good company, they will warn you already as you are walking down the path. Hey, watch that curtain. The last time someone tried to look there, they were sucked in. That's good company. Beautiful, because when you're with bad company, everyone's looking and you're the only guy who's not supposed to be looking. As they're looking, you're also going to say, okay guys, let's stop here, let's see what's going on here. These are the paths. And the hadith says there's a devil on every one of them, calling people, beautifying it. You know, they market it like it's a business product. They come to you and market. I remember once, there was a certain product that was absolutely useless. We were walking in the mall and these people, the way they presented it, you know, sir, this is what happened. I don't know why I even stopped to listen to what they had to say. I didn't need it. A lot of us have a sickness where we go to a mall, we don't want things, we don't need certain things. And do you know what we do? Just because it's two for the price of one. We start saying, hey, this thing is okay. But I didn't come to the mall for this. We end up buying things we never ever needed. We never ever really, and our money's finished. Then we get to the place we really wanted the stuff from. And we see, short of ringgits, let's go back home. Subhanallah. But you came for something. Be focused. So when I heard this, the person marketing the product, and they sold me something that I really did not need and did not want. But I believed it was so good. I got home and guess what? It didn't work. It didn't work at all. And I was so upset because no guarantee, no warranty. It was just a deal that you struck in the middle of nowhere and I regretted it. And I'm giving you that example today because it struck me at some stage to say, Shaitan does the same with us. He waits and he stops for us on the path and he talks to us and he convinces us, hey, this is beautiful, this is good, you need this. You don't need it at all. Trust me, you don't even want it. And Shaitan convinces us to say, you will enjoy, you will have this and we pay for it. We make a payment to sin, you're actually paying. And at the end of the day, you get nothing out of it. What did it do? It distracted you from the straight path. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from the wrong paths. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. So this is the hadith that I chose to mention today. And shaitan actually promised from the very beginning. Do you know what he says? 
He is promising Allah that oh I'm going to I'm going to wait in ambush for them on the straight path. Shaitan knows the straight path. He actually knows it. He knows it very, very well. And he's telling you, La lahum, I will wait for them in ambush. Siratak al Mustaqim upon the Sirat al Mustaqim. I'll wait. And I'll try and ambush them. And that's gonna be my the way that I'm going to do that. That verse is Surah Al-A'raf, verse number 16. And if you take a look at Allah, He tells us, no matter how many times the devil has got hold of you, you can get yourself out of the clutches of the devil just by turning to me, no matter how many times it has happened. For as long as you're alive, you have hope. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease and goodness. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was the one who brought the goodness. Earlier, we said Allah is the guide. You know, when the Prophet ﷺ lost his uncle, he was quite saddened. The reason is, his uncle helped him a lot, but didn't accept the message. He wasn't on the straight path, but helped him a lot in terms of defended him because he was a nephew and he liked him and so on. So at the end, when he passed away, not on Islam and Iman, it hurt the heart of Muhammad ﷺ to say, this man was so close to me and look at what happened. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided to clarify that guidance comes. And the clarification is for us actually. Guidance is from Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ Indeed, you do not guide whomsoever you wish, but it's Allah who guides whomsoever He wishes. So ask Allah's guidance. Obviously, ask Allah's guidance. I'm, I'm making the statement to you. It's not part of that particular verse. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is drawing our attention to the fact that He is the owner of guidance. So why then does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala address Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and says, وَإِنَّكَ لَتَهْدِي إِلَىٰ صِرَاطٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ Indeed, you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, guide to the straight path. Doesn't there seem to be a contradiction there? On one hand, Allah says, He is the only one who guides. And on the other hand, Allah is saying, You, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, guide to the straight path. So, we all know there's no contradictions in the Quran. What's the meaning of it? There's a clear, clear meaning. Guidance can be divided into two, three categories. And we can understand two of these categories very simply. To be able to walk on the path, that's in Allah's hands. The ability to walk on the path is given by Allah. But to be able to show someone the path, that Muhammad ﷺ was sent to do this. So if, I, if you ask me, how do I get to, for example, Singapore from here? And I give you some guidance and I tell you, listen, this is what you do and this is how you do it. It's up to you whether you want to follow it or not. So I've given you the guidance. So this means Muhammad ﷺ gave us the guidance. He gave us the Quran. He gave us this whole life of his, which was a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for us. A gift meaning he... Every aspect of his life is to be emulated as an act of worship and you achieve a reward as a result. So this is Muhammad sallallahu But the fact that he's shown you the path does not mean that he guided you to tread the path. He only guided you to show you where the path is. So one is called a tawfiq. Tawfiq meaning the acceptance from Allah to be able to walk on the path. That's only Allah. It's only Allah who al muwaffiq It's Allah who grants you that acceptance to be able to walk on the path. But al-dalalah wal-irshad, which means to be able to show you the path, that Muhammad ﷺ came, and that in fact is the duty of us all, to show someone else the path. That's why we are here today as well, to show the path to everyone and to try and help ourselves also to be able to tread that same path. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about how uh, those who don't believe in the hereafter, those who don't believe in the hereafter, they are actually not on the path. They will lose focus, which means part and parcel of this straight path is to believe in the life after death, to believe in the hereafter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, 
وَإِنَّ الَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْآخِرَةِ عَنِ الصِّرَاطِ لَنَاكِبُونَ Surah Al-Mu'minun verse number 74. Allah says, those who do not believe in the hereafter, those who do not believe in the akhirah, they will fall off that path, the straight path. They will go astray from the straight path, which means in order to tread the path, you need to have this accountability. I need to prepare an answer for Allah for everything I say or do. I need to have an answer for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I am responsible to Allah, answerable to Him. This is what will keep me on the path. Whenever there is something bad happening, immediately, I will tell myself, no, what am I going to say to Allah if I participate in this evil? Whenever there is something good that comes, I will immediately tell myself, let me do this so that I have something to tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You talk to Allah, you ask Allah's forgiveness. When you say astaghfirullah, do you know it's recorded? And that is going to come back to you. It's actually going to come straight to you. If you have said it a hundred times a day, you're going to have files and files of astaghfirullahs and you'll be so happy of them. On the day of judgment, may Allah accept it. But let's hope it is truthful. You don't just pay lip service to astaghfirullah. You don't. You actually say it. And I've always maintained that, you know, when we hear that the Prophet ﷺ has said Astaghfirullah a hundred times a day, which means I seek your forgiveness, O Allah, a hundred times a day. We think it's enough for us to sit with a few beads on one moment in the morning and within three minutes we've just said Astaghfirullah one hundred times. Did you ever know that not once is it recorded that Muhammad ﷺ said all those, I seek your forgiveness, Astaghfirullahs, in one sitting? Not once did it Record that he said it in one sitting. In fact, there are guaranteed narrations that prove that he scattered it through the day. One of them says, after every salah, he used to say, Astaghfirullah three times. So count how many salahs you have, multiplied by three. A minimum five salah, multiplied by three. And even if you are reading your sunnah and, ver- and various other prayers, there's no harm in saying Astaghfirullah once you are finished your salah. So you say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. You've just finished a beautiful act of worship with Allah and you're saying, Oh Allah, forgive me. What a straight path, subhanAllah. Oh Allah, forgive me. And you don't just say it because you're paying lip service to it. You are meaning it. Oh Allah, forgive me. If I die right here, right now, Oh Allah, forgive me. So you scatter it through the day. When you're walking, I ask Allah's forgiveness. Whatever you're doing. And this is a straight path because it keeps you in check. If you are asking Allah all the time, Oh Allah, forgive me, it means you are conscious of the fact that I shouldn't be doing things. You know, what's the point of slapping your child or your child slaps you? Let's make it more interesting, okay? <laughs> your child slaps you and says, Dad, I'm sorry. And he slaps you again, Dad, I'm sorry. And slaps you again, Dad, I'm sorry. You're going to say, what are you doing, man? What's going on? Are you playing a game here or something? Let's not have a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is of a similar nature where we keep on doing bad and we keep on saying, oh Allah, forgive me. And you're saying, you know, some people, they like to hear that Allah is merciful. Yes, indeed. They like to hear that Allah is merciful. Yes, indeed, Allah is so merciful. But we need to strike a balance between mercy, the mercy of Allah and His wrath and anger. The hope in His mercy and the fear of His wrath. Because when you have too much of hope, it becomes wrong. Too much. We are supposed to have as much hope as possible. Correct. Correct. But too much of hope, what does that mean? It means it makes you sin. Astaghfirullah. And you think to yourself, okay, you know, I've got this gambling to do. Don't know. I'll say astaghfirullah once I'm finished. Come on, you can't do that. You know, there's adultery to be committed. Never mind. No, no, no. I'll say astaghfirullah. After this, khalas. I'll just say astaghfirullah. How do you know that you're going to even survive to see the end of it? So when a person does that, where they are relying on the mercy of Allah, to commit a sin, then you need to know that now they, they've gone beyond a certain limit. And the same applies when a person fears Allah so much that they think we have no hope in going to paradise. They've lost the path. Because Allah tells you clearly, the straight path, you know what it is? Surah Zumar, Allah says, Say, O my worshippers, who have transgressed against themselves, never lose hope in the mercy of Allah. The fact that anyone loses hope, they've already swayed from the path. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from amongst those who are always hopeful. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all the ability to tread this beautiful path. In Surah Yasin, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about something very interesting. 
telling us what the straight path is. He says, And worship me, for indeed this is the straight path. Remember right at the beginning I told you that Surah Al-Fatiha has in it a dua that Allah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught us to ask for walking on the straight path. And I did say that just before that verse, Allah explains what the straight path is. The straight path is إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِنُ And then we are saying, Oh Allah, guide us on that same path. Keep us on it. And that is the path of all the messengers and so on. Here's another verse in Surah Yasin proving that to worship Allah alone is actually the straight path. وَأَنِعْبُدُونِي Worship me alone. هَذَا صِرَاطٌ مُسْتَقِيمٌ This is the straight path. You want to know what's the path? Here it is. Your GPS will take you from here to a mall, perhaps somewhere in Putrajaya. I think it's called Alamanda, if I'm not mistaken. But your Quran will take you to paradise. And in paradise, do you know what? There are no malls. Oh no, I'm sure some of the sisters must be saying, I wonder if I want to go there. Astaghfirullah. <laughs> but there's something mind-boggling that is far beyond the malls. When you go to Jannah, what you will have is so mind-boggling that you're going to forget about the bulk of the stuff that was on earth. Forget totally, you won't even know. I was giving an example a few days ago to some people. And I was telling them, those who lived in, nine, in the 1900s, when the penny farthing, you know, it's, it's a bicycle which has one big wheel and the other small little one. When that was the in thing and people couldn't afford it because it was extremely expensive, they used to say, or they probably said, I don't know because I haven't met them, but they probably said, oh, I can't afford this. But when I go to Jannah, I'll have one. Do you agree? Because that was the thing they knew. We do the same thing. I don't have an iPhone 6, but when I go to Jannah, inshallah, I'll have one. Okay? But now that we are in 2015, who would want a penny farthing? Tell me. Even if you choose a Mercedes of 1960, you know, my, one of my relatives had this Mercedes Benz of 1960, literally of 1960. And it used to drive so badly, it used to go boom, 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 boom. So we used to call it the boom, boom car. <laughs> Mashallah. And this boom, boom car, subhanAllah, today, no one wants it. But at that time, people used to say, May Allah give me this in Jannah, I can't afford it here. This all goes to prove that over time you will not want what you've asked for here, there. Think about it carefully. It's a powerful example. I am wishing for something in 2015. By the time 2050 comes already, it will be outdated. I won't want it myself. So why do I need to say, is this going to be in Jannah? Is that going to be? You hang on and see because Jannah comes after all these years are going to finish. So if the latest technology is in 3015, Jannah will come beyond that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an understanding. But, and this is the moral of my story. To get to that, you need to be walking on a path. It is called the straight path. That's the path of Allah. It's the path of His Rasul. And this is why the Quran itself is known as As-Sirah. It's known as the path. Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, when he was once asked, what's the meaning of this Sirat al-Mustaqim? He says, it's the Quran. And Ibn Abbas ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhuma, and also Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu on another occasion when he was asked, what is the straight path? He says, it is Al-Islam. Al-Islam, to submit to Allah, to worship your maker alone. And on another instance, some of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum have explained that it is to follow the path of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. All these are correct. They are all the straight path. Subhanallah. So let's try and inshallah walk on this beautiful path. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to grant us the ability to walk on it and not only to walk on it but to take others with us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. I want to end by saying something very, very important. Do you know that when you're walking on a path, it becomes much easier when you are actually calling others to walk on the same path? It becomes much easier. So for someone to walk on the path and they're all alone and they, you know, they, they have people, no one's calling them, they're calling no one else. To be honest with you, it becomes a little bit more difficult. The minute you have company and you're telling everyone, hey, come, there's a path here. You'll be walking on the path. Come, there's a path. And if you're diverting a little bit, you're going to remember to yourself, hey, but I'm the one telling everyone, walk on the path. Let's go. Come on, guys. So you walk. So from this, what we learn is what Rasulullah sallallahu was instructed to say. قُلْ هَذِهِ سَبِيلِي أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ عَلَى بَصِيرَةٍ أَنَا وَمَنِ اتَّبَعَنِي Say, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 
This is my sabil, my way. This is my way. And this sabil refers to the entire lifestyle of Muhammad sallallahu and Islam in general and the path to Allah. And it's within the sirat al-mustaqim. It's within the straight path. It's the, it's the way of life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, and it is Islam and the rules of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, regulations, the do's and don'ts. It's known as a sabil as well. In this verse, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is being instructed to say, tell them this is my path. I call towards it. Listen to this carefully. I call towards it with guidance. I call towards it and those who follow me also call towards it. According to one of the interpretations of that beautiful verse. Which means, I will call towards the goodness and anyone who follows me will also call towards the same goodness. So our duty is to call towards the same goodness. And that makes it so easy to walk on the path. I can give you so many examples, subhanAllah. I promised the brothers that I would stop at 45 minutes on the dot. I've overstepped by 22 seconds, mashallah. <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us and grant us ease. May Allah make it easy for us to tread the path. I have another session this afternoon and I'm sure the other mashayikh will be joining shortly. And I hope and I pray that by the end of this beautiful convention, we will all have a better picture. Not only the picture, but we will all be uh, much more on the straight path than we were in the past, myself included. May Allah bless you all. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.